Hello. It looks like we're recording, so I will proceed. So on Friday, I didn't have time enough to give you much background when it came to um, Islam. Now, the reading that you had gave some information, but I think you need a broader picture as well. And that's what I'm sending out to provide you in this uh, video. So let's turn to a PowerPoint that I've created that addresses just this very point. Let's see if I can get it to pull up. Here we go. So, Islam. You might not notice my background here. This is indeed an image of the desert in the Arabian Peninsula. So, here's the kind of problem. Here's the thing. Think back to about the year 570. What was going on on the Arabian Peninsula at that time? Well, the Roman Empire had come to an end about a hundred years or so ago. The Arabian Peninsula was mostly controlled by clans. And these clans were constantly engaged in conflict with each other in what's known as blood feuds, where they would have engagements and whoever was victorious would kill everyone else. It was pretty nasty. Um, there was one bright exception, however. There was a city by the name of Mecca. And in Mecca, there was a central um, temple. And in this temple, they had altars to all these different gods because the Arabian people at this time were polytheists. And as a result, Mecca was one of the few places that had peace where people could meet and carry on business. So around 570, we find that the man who comes to be called Muhammad the prophet is born. Muhammad, prophet, may peace be upon him, as our Muslim friends say. Well, he lived from about 570 to 632. And he was born into a merchant family, so of a fairly prosperous background. However, he was orphaned as a child, and he was sent to be raised by the Bedouins. Now, there are still Bedouins on the Arabian Peninsula to this day. They are considered the most Arab of the Arabs, and they get certain special privileges. So, he, being raised by Bedouins, he knew his way around the desert, and eventually he came to become a, a caravan leader. And lo and behold, a woman who was 15 years older than him, by the name of Khadija, very wealthy woman, ran a string of caravans. And she was so impressed by his work that, you know what? She proposed to him, and she was very wealthy. And that was his first wife. Well, while he was married to her around the year 610, he experiences the calling to be a prophet. He was in the habit of going to a cave near Mecca called the Cave of Hira. And uh, one time when he was there, praying and meditating, suddenly he's entranced by a vision of an angel, the angel Gabriel. And the angel Gabriel holds a scroll in front of him and says to Muhammad, recite. Now, this is kind of interesting because Muhammad was himself illiterate. But when he had these visions, he could read in the visions. Apparently he had quite a capacious memory because some of these um, scrolls were quite, quite long. Well, he uh, would memorize what he saw in these scrolls, in his visions, and he would share it with other people who would write them down. And in the course of time, that became the Quran. Uh, it's important to know to remember that in about 620, we find the passage called the Isra Mirage, where in a vision he travels from Mecca to Jerusalem, then from heaven to hell, and he speaks to Abraham, 
Moses, and Jesus. This is important because it places Islam then far soundly within the context of, a, of Abrahamic religions. 622. So for about 12 years, he had been preaching his, the texts that were revealed to him in his visions, and he was gaining a following. But here's the deal, the leaders of Mecca, a uh, large part of their fortune depended upon the fact that people would go to that central temple to uh, make offerings of the altars of one or another god. Idolatry was kind of their, um, kind of their business. And Islam to this day takes a very strong position against idolatry. He was forced to flee from the city of Mecca at one point in 622 to the city that would come to be known as Medina. And that uh, event marks the start of the Muslim calendar. About 624, he creates the Medina Compact. Uh, basically, you had two classes of citizens. Those who are Muslim were the only ones who could be full citizens. But if you were either Christian or Jewish, then you were considered a member of one of the religions of the book. And you had to pay a special tax, but it wasn't that burden, burdensome. And if you did that, you would be tolerated. Uh, large part of that was that you had to give your loyalty to being and identify first and foremost as a Muslim as opposed to a member of a particular clan or tribe. And that was important because it was an attempt to bring an end to the blood feuds. Well, he returns to Mecca in about the year 630. And uh, he and about 10,000 um, followers are successful in uh, conquering Mecca, and they do so almost. The, the author of the text is a bit um, exaggerated, it's a little bit that it was bloodless. Uh, Twelve Meccans died, and two Muslims died in the course of the attack. Still, from that time in that place, that was almost unheard of. Moreover, once he overtook Mecca, we're talking a time of total warfare. So if you conquered one side, one side conquers another, it was kind of expected that you slaughtered everyone. He didn't. Rather, with a few exceptions, he said, convert to Islam and you will be allowed to live. Well, lots of people converted. On the exception that were 10 people that were condemned to execution, but three of these converted to Islam and they were spared. So he destroys the pagan sites and that site is now the site of the Grand Mosque in Mecca. And it has a shrine called the Kaaba where um, Muslims go and they circle counterclockwise sometimes also in certain prayers. And that is considered one of the requirements to be a devout Muslim. So what do Muslims believe? They believe that the Quran represents the basic moral values of Islam. Things like the fact that you should honor your parents and show kindness to neighbors, not just your Muslim neighbors, any neighbors. You have a duty to protect orphans and widows. You have a duty to give generously to the poor. Murder, stealing, and lying, and adultery are condemned very strongly. Gambling, the eating of pork, and the drinking of alcohol are prohibited. And the Quran also has rules about marriage and divorce. There are six fundamental beliefs to be that are taken as the foundation of Muslim um, worldview. First, they strongly emphasize a single indivisible God. They are strict monotheists. In fact, from their perspective, the Christian Trinity looks a bit odd. It looks suspiciously 
like polytheism to them. Uh, they do believe in angels. After all, his revelation came from the angel Gabriel. They do believe in the divine scriptures, and that includes the Old Testament and the New Testament. Now, they believe the Old Testament and the New Testament have become corrupted in the course of time, but they still acknowledge that they are sacred scriptures. They believe in messengers of God, which is to say prophets, uh, but they believe that Muhammad is the last of the prophets, the seal of the prophets. There is a day of judgment that will be coming. They do believe that there is, uh, that God's will is supreme. Five pillars of Islam. Five major things that you have to do if you're a Muslim. First, you must acknowledge that God is one and that Muhammad is his prophet. Uh, merely making that statement is sufficient enough to be initiated and considered a true Muslim. You have to pray five times a day if you are Sunni Muslim. I'll get to the distinction momentarily. Three times a day if you are Shiite. Now, that being said, it's the same prayers. But I've talked to Sunni uh, Imams who inform me that the Shiites combine two of the prayers uh, at one time or another in the course of the day. So they're doing the same prayers, but the timing differs between the Sunnis and the Shiites. Once a year, they have a lunar calendar, and on their calendar, once a year, there's a month called Ramadan. And during Ramadan, you have to abstain from food and drink from dawn to sunset. Uh, this is supposed to teach us obedience, humility, and self-control. Uh, at the at sunset, you can eat a few dates and drink either water or milk before eating your real meal. Charity, zakat, you must give money to the mosque and the church leaders are to distribute the money to the poor. I've been to one or two mosques in my time. Usually there's one or two different places where they have their uh, devotees uh, contribute money. One is to the upkeeping of the mosque and the other is towards zakat and they keep those two funds very separate. Five is the Hajj, which is a pilgrimage to Mecca. And you are supposed to go to Mecca at least once in your life. Now, I don't know if you can see the cursor here, but you see the little black square in the center here. That is the Kaaba, that is the holiest of holies. And all people in uh, Islam, that's the direction towards which they bow when they pray. And if you go on the Hajj, if you're a Muslim, uh, there's a sequence of prayers that you're supposed to say while circling the, the Kaaba seven times. There are three distinct sects of Islam. The first are the Sunnis. They are the followers of the Hanifa, Shafi, Hannibal, and Malik schools. They constitute 90% of the believers and are considered to be the mainstream traditionalists. Because they are comfortable pursuing their faith within secular societies, they have been able to adopt to a variety of national cultures while following their three sources of law, the Quran, the Hadith, and the consensus of Muslims. So if you meet a Muslim, they will probably be Sunni here in the United States. The Shiites are the remaining 10%. They're followers of the Jafri school. Uh, they split from the Sunnis over a dispute about the successor to Muhammad. Their leaders promote a strict interpretation of the Quran and a close adherence to its teachings. They are the closest that Islam comes to uh, fundamentalists. They believe in 12 heavenly Imams or perfect teachers who've led the Shiites in succession. The Shiites believe that the 12th Imam was called the Mahdi uh, never died, but went into a state of what we call uh, occultation. So he's hidden from time and space for now, but he will return and guide humans towards justice and peace. Finally, there's a third sect, or is it? Because it falls into a gray area, because the Sufis are the mystics of Islam. Now, um, most Sufis are either Sunnis or Shiites. So Sufism is something that rides on top of being either a Sunni or a Shiite. It's a mystic tradition in which followers seek inner knowledge 
directly from God through meditation and ritual and dancing. The tradition develops late in the 10th century as an ascetic reaction to the formalism and laws of the Quran. There are Sufis from both the Sunni and Shiite group. However, some Sunni followers do not consider Sufism to be a valid Islamic practice. They incorporate ideas from Neoplatonism, Buddhism, and Christianity. They emphasize personal union with the divine. In the Middle East, some Sufi traditions are considered to be a separate school of Islam. In North and Sub Saharan Africa, Sufism is more of a style and an approach. I think I've mentioned in class that whenever we're dealing with mysticism, there's always a challenge and always a conflict, or, or at least some tension between mysticism and organized hierarchical um, religion. Because the whole point of mysticism is that you can have a direct and unmediated experience of the divine. So Sufis, um, the extent to which they are tolerated largely depends upon how conservative the school of Islam is in a given country. So Sufis are tolerated in Turkey, for example, at least so far, um, but um, their position in places like Saudi Arabia is rather tentative and tenuous, shall we say, because they are mystics. So a common misconception is this word jihad. Now, jihad does not really mean holy war. Rather, there is a word for that, harb makwadasa. Harb means war, makwadasa is holy. So they actually do have a word for holy war, but it's not jihad. Rather, jihad means striving or struggling. So, and I think a class or two ago, I talked about the just war theory. Well, the just war theory, as we know it now, was developed around 1200, um, mostly by St. Thomas Aquinas, but he was influenced by St. Augustine. Uh, about the 400s. Well, uh, Muhammad developed his own theory about uh, just war, rules of engagement. So according to Muhammad, before you can get into a state of war, you have to have purity of intention. You can't be setting out to engage in war just for profit or fame. A uh, declaration by a legitimate authority you should never kill innocent people. You should never injure prisoners of war. You should never kill animals or destroy crops or infrastructure or mutilate bodies of enemies dead or alive. Now at this point, let me point out, I think there's a lot of interesting correspondences between Muhammad's rules and engagement and uh, the just war, the Christian just war theory. All prisoners should be given fair treatment. Women and children should be protected from harm. And you should always bury the dead, not just your dead, the dead. You should uh, bury the dead with respect. And it bears noting, this was about a good 1400 years before the Geneva Conventions. So for that context, historically, it was unusually advanced. Moreover, all too often, our popular culture, Islam, is associated with terrorism. But actually, if you properly understand Islam, uh, terrorism does not fit at all with the true understanding of Islam. Uh, there is never a political or religious justification for terrorism. Terrorism is a crime, an explicit violation of Islam. And although many crimes are committed in the names of other religions, sadly, uh, the people who deviate from mainstream Islam and commit acts of terrorism, all too often the association, the assumption is that they, make, that they are typical. Well, folks, um, Timothy McVeigh was a devout Catholic, and he infamously um, destroyed the Moral Federal Building in Oklahoma. Before 9-11, it was the single greatest terrorist act here in the United States. 
but we would not condemn all Christians because of Timothy McVeigh. There's a long and dark history of lynching here in the United States, often committed by people who belonged to the Ku Klux Klan. The Ku Klux Klan explicitly identified as a Christian organization, but we would not condemn all of Christianity because of the Ku Klux Klan. So why is it that all too many people condemn all of Islam before, because of the behaviors and the deeds of people who are outliers and whose actions utterly go against and violate the true beliefs of Islam. So there's my presentation on the history and the background of Islam. I'm going, I hope this will record this time. It didn't record the first time I tried to do this. So I will share this on Blackboard. I encourage you to read it. I might work some of these points into a take home quiz. You are duly warned. Uh, I think this is some important background that the author of the essay that you read just assumed most people would know. And I think he's probably wrong to that extent. So I don't know about you all. I mean, I'm all for social distancing, but I think this is a bit much. Let me go to a more convenient and comfortable setting. Oh, I don't know. How about my library here? So that said, that's my talk about Islam. And I will be sharing this with you on Blackboard shortly.